be a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Vladislav Yakovlev. He, he got his PhD in physics and quantum uh, electronics from the Moscow State University. He's a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Texas A&M University. And uh, Professor Yakovlev has been uh, focusing his research in the development of new instrumentation for biomedical diagnostics and imaging. Uh, especially uh, research interests are on biomechanics on a micro scale level, nanoscope optical imaging of uh, molecular and cellular structures, protein spectroscopy and structure dynamics, bioanalytical applications of optical technology and spectroscopy, and deep tissue imaging and sensing. And uh, Václav has already been here in Brazil and visiting our group. He's uh, uh, a very nice uh, uh, colleague to do research and to discuss all these uh, interesting scientific field. So thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and to be here and talk to this uh, Brazilian community in photonics. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. Okay, so it is a really gr great pleasure to be here and to present uh, some of our recent work uh, here today. Uh, so I'm in biomedical engineering, but uh, my background is uh, in physics. So uh, I, uh, for this uh, particular presentation, uh, choose a little bit of both, uh, a little bit of physics, uh, a little bit of biomedical engineering. And uh, at the end, uh, I want to introduce uh, to you uh, a relatively new optical imaging uh, technology, uh, which is based on Brewer uh, spectroscopy. So once again, okay, so I want to thank uh, um, organizers for uh, opportunity to talk to uh, you today. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, please just uh, email me or uh, stay uh, here online so that uh, I can address uh, your questions and concerns. So a little bit uh, of uh, history, we can also and uh, uh, I will start uh, with a uh, uh, slightly different technique, uh, which is called Raman spectroscopy. So Raman spectroscopy is much more common and uh, also it was uh, uh, first discovered or so considered to be first discovered by uh, Raman in uh, 1928, but uh, apparently okay, also simultaneously or uh, even uh, one week uh, early, it was discovered by Landsberg and Mandelstam, okay, also two Russian scientists. Uh, well, so they published it a little bit later than Raman published uh, uh, his own work. And as a result of this, the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to Raman in 1930. Also, Russians uh, still call it uh, inelastic combinatorial light scattering effect rather than Raman effect. But uh, if uh, both groups uh, knew a little bit uh, more about uh, the uh, history of this, uh, so they would know that uh, this effect was actually predicted five years before that uh, by uh, Smekel, who uh, first predicted uh, theoretically the Raman effect. So pretty much similar uh, uh, history is uh, for Brillouin spectroscopy. So um, uh, the name comes uh, from Leo Brillouin, who is a French scientist, who suggested in 1922 that uh, light will be inelastically scattered if you have an induced acoustic wave in the medium. So if you come with an incident light and you have uh, some acoustic uh, uh, wave in your medium, so uh, light will uh, get uh, the uh, scattered, and the scattered is called the broa scattered. So it's an elastically scattered light, and uh, it characterizes information uh, about media related to acoustic waves. So now uh, what uh, Leo Brilla actually uh, uh, discussed in his work, we call stimulated uh, uh, Brilla scattering. But this was all theory work. So uh, the other guy, okay, also Leonid Malderstam, okay, also, who is uh, also known for 
uh, invention of uh, Raman spectroscopy. So he suggested that this inelastic scattering can also occur when there is no acoustic wave present. So a light can scatter on fluctuations in the medium, and he derived the formula for that, and he found out that she, uh, this uh, frequency shift will be related to longitudinal modulus of uh, the medium. So this is very important. Because by doing this measurement, you can essentially measure the longitudinal model of uh, uh, your medium. And he, um, he first reported this in 1918, okay, also, but first published it in 1926. And it was a clear step forward with respect to Brillouin work because uh, it allowed you okay, also to essentially apply this uh, technique for any kind of medium because it doesn't actually require you to have uh, acoustic wave present in the medium. And of course, okay, well, so both of those uh, works were uh, theoretical in nature, and really we okay, well, so uh, someone we should uh, truly appreciate for uh, the advancement of this field is uh, Eugene Grossi, who first uh, using a set of etalons uh, demonstrated in 1930, the very first Brillouin spectra, and this was the beginning of uh, uh, Brillouin spectroscopy. So basically, we keep also um, my first research project, which was when I was a, a junior student, uh, uh, was uh, related to Mandelstam Brillouin uh, scattering in laser produced plasma. So my advisor, he was so um, unfortunately, he was so he passed away. He was so shortly after uh, my graduation, but uh, he actually comes uh, from uh, the academic tree of uh, Leonid Mandelstam uh, family. So uh, basically, he was so uh, Leonid Mandelstam is my uh, grand uh, grand father um, in terms of uh, academic world. So right now, okay, also Brillouin spectroscopy is widely used uh, in um, imaging and uh, microscopy. So I just uh, gave you okay, also kind of a snapshot of uh, uh, what uh, uh, is done just in our group on applications of Brillouin spectroscopy uh, for biological imaging. So we can do cancer imaging, we can look at muscular dystrophy, which affects uh, the elasticity of the muscles. So we can look at uh, various uh, um, uh, problems uh, related to cardiovascular diseases. So we can look at artificial and natural uh, biomaterials, and we can also do whole body imaging. But today I will talk about uh, some dynamic properties uh, of uh, Brillouin imaging. So how we can actually look at uh, uh, dynamical properties uh, related to uh, local viscoelastic properties. And here you okay, also something that uh, probably okay, also uh, everyone should uh, know by now. Okay, also, but it's called Gartner uh, hypercycle. So for any technology okay, also, which uh, is being developed, it's uh, going to okay, also through this uh, cycle. So uh, on the horizontal uh, uh, scale is the uh, time, uh, the upper, uh, uh, the vertical scale is visibility, and you see that it goes uh, through the peak and then okay, also just uh, kind of uh, disappears. So where do we stay here? So we are still here on the rising uh, side of it. So we are still okay, also trying okay, also, uh, to understand okay, also, what are the limitations of this technology. And that's why okay, also, I think this is a very exciting field. We have not reached the peak yet. See? So we know that after this peak, okay, also, things will go down. But right now, okay, also, it's a truly exciting field because for the very first time, it allows you microscopic uh, imaging of mechanical properties of cells and tissues. And here are just some uh, simple examples. So this is the work which we did with, uh, together with uh, uh, Kazakhstan University. And uh, what we did, okay, well, so we tried to look at uh, how do bones uh, reconstruct. So essentially, okay, well, so we're using okay, well, so some special proteins, uh, uh, stem cells, uh, and uh, uh, some cocktail of uh, 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 additional uh, chemicals okay, also to initiate uh, the regrowth of those uh, bonds. But question is okay, well, so you, know, you get uh, some reconstruction there, okay, also well, which happens after uh, several weeks. How do you evaluate the properties of it? So apparently, okay, well, so 
Well, we can do this uh, using Burwell spectroscopy. And okay, also in this particular case, okay, also you can clearly see that she, the uh, uh, changes the uh, as uh, with respect to control, uh, well pronounced, and we can see this uh, uh, using Burwell spectroscopy. So this uh, work was uh, really okay, also the groundbreaking because it uh, showed you uh, how Brillouin spectroscopy can actually be used uh, in controlling uh, the regenerative uh, medicine. So we can also look at uh, some other interesting uh, applications. Say for example, okay, also, um, also obesity, okay, well, so it's a big problem in the United States. And we looked at the effects of obesity and we tried to understand, okay, well, so how does it affect the mechanical and chemical properties? Because it's kind of well known that the mechanical properties of tissues uh, should be changed, okay, well, so if uh, people become fat. Well, so, but she, well, they actually, okay, also well, looked into this. And we were the first ones, okay, well, so who were actually um, evaluated the effect of uh, uh, these uh, fat rich diets to find out that the adipose uh, tissue becomes uh, stiffer in obesity. And she, uh, there are several consequences of this, okay, well, so I will not go into the details, but she, uh, once again, okay, well, so just because uh, we developed this uh, new technique, it allowed us uh, to look at uh, those uh, properties as well. You can start looking at uh, some faster dynamics. Say, for example, okay, well, so we take this uh, zebrafish uh, embryo, and you see that it's alive, okay, well, so because the uh, uh, blood is moving, and uh, we can image the whole uh, zebrafish embryo, okay, well, so we have brighter color and corresponds to uh, stiffer parts uh, of uh, the body. And then we can just uh, focus on the heart beating. And uh, we can actually see how heart uh, contracts uh, using uh, this uh, mechanical probe. So this is uh, by far okay, well, so the most impressive results okay, well, so, uh, we've seen in terms of dynamical changes uh, in biological system induced uh, you know, also seen by uh, this uh, type of spectroscopy. So we can look at uh, calculation dynamics. So in this case, okay, well, so we were trying to see okay, well, so how does the uh, uh, well, so conglobation happens, and how does it affect the, uh, the mechanical properties? Also, we looked into this, okay, also for uh, different uh, compositions, and that's, okay, also where we first uh, found uh, the real problem with our measurements. So when we are trying to make those measurements at very long uh, time scales, so we see that uh, the time scale is uh, 2,000 uh, 2, seconds, so we actually we also couldn't get accurate measurements because see, we started to see we also that see, our system is not that accurate. And this is see, the first time okay, well, so we actually ask ourselves how accurate are actually our measurements and how we can optimize those see, for uh, faster measurements and see, for long-term measurements. And to, to do that, see, what we did, we did see what is called the Allen uh, variance uh, statistical analysis. So the idea is uh, quite simple and you can do it for every single instrument she, that you are possibly using. So what you do, okay, well, so you just uh, continuously record she, uh, your measurements as a function of time. So in this case, it's number of samples averaged and you can also look at she, the statistical variance of your signal. So it's essentially we give also your uh, uh, noise to single ratio. So you see that, okay, well, so at first you see that, okay, well, so it kind of decays and then it goes up, decays and goes up. And it's true for any kind of uh, instrumentation. So you always see these kind of behavior. And that means that for every single measurement, there is a sweet spot, okay, well, so where you achieve uh, the maximum performance of your instrument. So having this in mind, okay, well, so we can design our experiments in such a way so we can produce the most accurate measurements and to apply those for dynamic studies. So one of the applications that we were particularly interested, we were interested in seeing how cells respond to, uh, to external electrical field. So this is actually okay, well, so it's a big problem um, also in terms of uh, delivering of uh, uh, medicine, in particular vaccine, okay, well, so using uh, electrical pulses, uh, 
also is typically associated with elect operation. In there are uh, multiple parameters you can choose, see, but we were interested to see, okay, well, so what kind of uh, uh, mechanical effects uh, this uh, elect operation has see, on cells and tissues. So the experiment is quite simple. So what you see in dark, okay, well, so are just the uh, two electrodes and two cells are in between those electrodes. So you apply the high voltage between those electrodes and to see the result see, of uh, uh, those uh, changes. And uh, also with the number, the increasing number of electrical pulses, we see that elasticity okay, also changes, viscosity changes as well, and we really wanted to see okay, also what is going on there. So what is happening with those cells after we apply uh, those electrical pulses? So are those changes instantaneous or they are taking uh, some time to uh, have an effect? So uh, in principle, okay, also there are plenty of ways of uh, looking at uh, these effects. So this electroporation can be readily absorbed to okay, also either through absorbing calcium waves or just using special dye molecules which penetrate uh, those uh, molecule, uh, those uh, cells uh, through the pores in membrane. And you see that, okay, also in this case, okay, also they are populating those cells. So that means that uh, those uh, cells in which, uh, which shine green, okay, well, so they actually uh, cover, uh, they actually uh, have some pores in those. So we built our system and we call it the multimodal system because it allows us to measure not only uh, the Brewer spectra, which allow us to assess mechanical properties, but it also allows us to look at uh, fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy. So we can pretty much, we can also see anything else uh, other people can see, plus we can assess uh, the mechanical properties. So this is uh, just the, uh, uh, showing you some uh, typical Brewer spectra. Okay, well, so there is a very tiny shift of the spectrum, so which we then convert into uh, the frequency shift and uh, then display this. Okay, also well, using uh, those uh, histograms, and you can see that depending on where you are inside the cell, so you see different mechanical properties. So uh, means that uh, different parts of the cell exhibit uh, different mechanical properties. So you can also do uh, uh, three-dimensional imaging. So in this case, okay, well, so what we did, okay, well, so we took these uh, three cells and to image it to all the way, okay, well, so from the surface uh, where they attach the, uh, to uh, the glass substrate to all the way up. And you see that, okay, well, so mechanical properties change. So just on the surface, uh, because uh, those cells are attached to this uh, very rigid uh, substrate, so they are kind of mechanically rigid. But if you are going away from the surface, so they become softer and softer, and you can actually see some uh, subcellular structures. So this was uh, a truly exciting result. But even more exciting okay, also results we saw when we exposed those uh, cells uh, to electrical field. So just a single electrical pulse, and we see that, okay, well, so after we excite uh, this uh, cell with uh, electrical pulse, well, we see a slow degradation of elastic properties. So that means that, okay, well, so the property of the cell is changing over time. So what do we see here? So in black, okay, well, so it shows Brewer shift, which corresponds to elastic properties. So in red, it shows the Brewer line width, which uh, corresponds to viscosity. And you see that, okay, well, so dynamics is different. So viscosity first drops fast, and then, okay, well, so uh, drops uh, quite uh, gradually. So while elastic properties are gradually decreasing in time. So we can repeat those measurements say, for uh, different uh, systems, say, uh, for different parts of the cells. So okay, also, and she, also in this case, okay, also well, we do this uh, for nuclear plasma, and she, then okay, also well, we can also change uh, the electrical field, she, so to see that indeed, okay, also well, we see uh, the strong dependence on electrical field, she, and she, uh, clearly, okay, also well, depending on where we are in the cell, we see dramatic differences. 
So cytoplasm is the one ocular cell which is the most affected. So then ocular cell is nucleoplasm and then nucleus. But even nucleus ocular cell gets affected by this electrical field. So this was the first um, uh, ever uh, discovery of this effect. Because most people ocular cell think that only the cytoplasm is affected, but apparently ocular cell uh, the whole cell is affected too through this electrical pulse interaction. So how we can do it faster? So uh, this was all uh, measured okay, also with like one second uh, acquisition time, so which is uh, fast, but not fast enough. So we want to do it even faster. And to do that, we will use uh, what originally Brewer uh, suggested is to use the uh, stimulated effect. So coming with the uh, two pulses and uh, uh, creating this type of grating, okay, well, so we simultaneously excite uh, uh, two acoustic waves which are propagating in opposite direction one to each other. So it's a kind of dynamic grating from which you give us away by applying the third pulse, we can scatter it off and look at the changes of this grating, okay, well, so, uh, which uh, results in the signal like this. Okay, well, so it's basically, okay, well, so it's uh, just a uh, decaying uh, oscillation. When you do fast Fourier transform, so you get your Brewer spectrum. Very simple. One pulse and you get the, all the measurements done. So how fast you can do this? Also, you can do this within these uh, 300 nanoseconds. So you can do it uh, at uh, 10 to the 6 uh, uh, times uh, uh, per second. So it's uh, faster than anything you can possibly do okay, also with uh, spontaneous uh, Brewer scattering. So recently we updated our system, okay, well, so we improved the sensitivity and detection. So now we can do all these measurements in real time and we will try to uh, use this system to look at even faster dynamic changes. What we are really looking for is uh, to look at mitochondria. So mitochondria, okay, well, so is known for as a powerhouse in the cell and she, uh, as a result of this uh, electron uh, transfer chain. So what happens, okay, well, so it constantly pumps the uh, proteins outside to the membrane. So as a result of this, the, the membrane potential changes, but this membrane potential is very difficult to measure. So but she, this the membrane potential apparently is, a, uh, is affecting the stiffness of this membrane. So the idea what I want to do is uh, to look at the, the stiffness of this membrane in response uh, to some external stimulus. For example, okay, also using photodynamic uh, uh, light excitation. So uh, we did some measurements uh, using Raman uh, measurements. Okay, well, so we looked at uh, the metabolic activity induced by uh, light. And we see that, okay, well, so indeed, okay, well, so we see this uh, um, uh, uh, photobiomodulation effect uh, on this uh, mitochondria. So now we want to complement these measurements with uh, membrane potential measurements. And we believe that uh, we can do this uh, using this technique. So um, it's always a question, okay, well, so how we can do better. So apparently, okay, well, so, uh, we can do even better, okay, well, so using squeeze light. So essentially, okay, well, so squeeze light, okay, well, so it's a quantum light. So what it does for you, okay, well, so it reduces uh, your um, uh, noise in your system. And as I showed you before, so noise is the, the limiting factor in all these measurements. So by using this uh, squeeze light, okay, well, so we're using a uh, technique, okay, well, so which is uh, widely known in quantum optics, we can actually, okay, well, so improve uh, uh, the sensitivity of these measurements. We can reduce the amount of power we can use uh, uh, for those uh, Brewer measurements, and we can achieve much faster imaging with uh, much uh, better sensitivity. So where we are now? So on the instrumentation side, we are getting better every year. So there's always a question, is uh, spontaneous is uh, better than coherent Brewer okay, well, So we believe that uh, coherent Brewer okay, well, so, uh, can produce better single to noise, better spatial and time resolution. So this is, uh, I believe is uh, the future. So uh, we are still uh, uh, only exploring uh, the effect of quantum light uh, on uh, those measurements. And we believe that uh, 
uh, quantum uh, light she can improve uh, both the sensitivity of those measurements and she uh, the spatial resolution and the uh, sensitivity of those measurements unfortunately there are a limited number of companies which are providing you with uh, this instrumentation so most of the instrumentation is currently done by uh, home built uh, systems but i think that okay well so uh, with uh, the number of uh, really hot topics uh, which are uh, currently being uh, considered, okay, well, so uh, we are sure that more uh, companies uh, will come to this uh, field. So there are plenty of uh, uh, biological and medical questions we want to answer. So we are still, okay, well, so as I said, okay, well, so we're just uh, touching the very surface of uh, uh, one of these uh, techniques and what is possible. So there are many other uh, systems that uh, um, we are thinking of, okay, also beyond what I have already mentioned, because there are also competitive uh, techniques see, such as atomic force microscope. But remember that this is just a surface uh, probe, so you can't look inside the cell. So we can, and uh, our results, for example, uh, for nuclear imaging, uh, clearly demonstrated that we can do that. So with this, I want to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this work and all the funding which made this work possible. And thank you very much for your attention. And I would be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vlad. Uh, I'm looking here at the chat. There's a question from uh, Professor Sebastian Prataviera. Thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, what's the magnitude order of the spontaneous brillouin scattering signal in comparison with fluorescence and HAMA, for example? Okay, and uh, it's a very good question and she, many people ask this question. Uh, so uh, we typically say that brillouin signal is the uh, uh, stronger than uh, Raman signal, but is significantly weaker than uh, fluorescence uh, signal. So uh, that's why okay, well, so we typically prefer to use the uh, uh, new infrared light uh, for uh, Brewer excitation so that it doesn't interfere with uh, our uh, fluorescent signal. It's not a problem of separating uh, fluorescence from Brillouin signal because the uh, Brillouin signal is only measured in a very narrow part of the spectrum, but it's more like, okay, well, so we are using um, a milliwatt of uh, average uh, power, and uh, these powers, uh, uh, your fluorescence uh, typically photo bleaches very, very fast, and uh, this is not something that uh, uh, you want to see for your sample if you're using fluorescent markers. And the second question from Sebastian also, what's the minimum time or dual time to get a signal from a spot? Okay, very good question. Okay, well, so uh, once again, okay, well, so uh, if you are using spontaneous Brewer uh, signal, so our current state of the art is about uh, 20 milliseconds. In 20 milliseconds, we can get uh, a reasonably good uh, signal which we can use uh, for cell imaging. So this is uh, how fast we can do it using spontaneous Brewer. So if we're using stimulated Brewer signal, so in this case, uh, uh, our dwell time is of the order of uh, several microseconds. So we can uh, go more than a thousand times uh, faster than spontaneous Brewer. Okay, thank you. And uh, a question from Professor Luciano Bachmann. Thank you for the nice presentation. Do we have some results about mechanical properties of cells when are irradiated with low laser power, for instance, photo? biomodulation fluences? Actually, we do, okay, well, so we did this actually by accident, okay, well, so what happened was that we were trying to image cells uh, which were uh, also um, labeled with uh, fluorescent dye, and apparently that fluorescent dye, okay, well, so uh, was a kind of, okay, well, so uh, mimicking photodynamic therapy. So, um, in a sense, okay, well, so we were actually, okay, well, so looking at those cells uh, which were subjected uh, to this uh, um, photodynamic therapy. Uh, 
We haven't done photo modulation uh, um, uh, studies yet, okay, well, so, but uh, uh, this is uh, all uh, for the future work, okay, well, so, uh, but uh, this is uh, clearly uh, something of uh, our interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't, oh, there is another question here from Professor Denise Zezel. When low intensity light shines to a cell, how to measure the depolarization in the membrane? It will probably change the permeability of it. Yes, okay, well, so this is the, uh, uh, really, okay, well, so the question that we want to answer. So um, our um, idea is that if uh, you have, uh, uh, if your membrane, okay, well, so changes its uh, polarization, so the stiffness of this membrane will change. And uh, since uh, we are so accurate in measurement, in measuring this uh, uh, stiffness. Uh, so we uh, think that we will be able to uh, assess uh, uh, these uh, polarization changes uh, uh, using our Brula uh, microscopy. So um, this is uh, the uh, idea for our future experiments. And uh, so hopefully we will do this uh, over this summer. Okay. I don't see any other questions here from the audience. But I do have one question, Vlad. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, recent papers have been uh, presenting that the cytoplasmic solution is not homogeneous. They do have some difference in uh, membrane-less structures, like uh, some aggregate uh, biomolecules there. Do you think uh, Brillouin imaging would be a nice technique to yes. uh, we look at them? Right, we actually uh, did see measure those and we did see this, okay? So uh, it's really okay, also something that uh, we want to study uh, because, uh, um, well, so we find out that for different cells, uh, we see different type of uh, uh, distribution of mechanical proteins inside the cells. So recently we did very interesting studies uh, with MD Anderson Cancer Center, where we looked at uh, uh, the uh, tumor cells uh, invasion uh, into um, uh, extracellular matrix. So how we see the change of mechanical properties of those cells. Uh, so how do they change uh, when they are trying to invade the uh, uh, the uh, other regions of uh, tissues. So how do they adapt to, to the local environment? And interestingly enough, okay, well, so we see that uh, within each individual cell, we see different distribution uh, of uh, mechanical properties depending on uh, what uh, this cell is trying to do. So when, for example, okay, well, so it, it tries to form a tumor, okay, well, so it becomes actually more homogeneous. While, okay, well, so when it tries to invade uh, uh, some uh, different uh, other parts of the tissue, so it, it becomes uh, uh, less homogeneous, okay, well, so in mechanical properties are uh, uh, more uh, dispersed uh, over uh, the whole cell. So, that's a very interesting observation. Okay, well, so we're still trying to find out what is the reason for that. But uh, people who are studying those uh, cell uh, invasions, so they think that this is precisely what she, they expected to see. So it's a, a very, very nice topic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be looking at these uh, studies from you. Very interesting field. So thank you very much once again, Professor Yakubulev. Uh, I think we have to move on, but I, I guess people can also send you questions by email. Yes. There is still. Thank you very much for your presentation, for uh, joining this conference. Thank you.